Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another edition of Beyond the Album Cover, where we get the scoop inside the entertainment industry with those in the know and give them their flowers while they're here to be celebrated. With me right now, I have a man who, if you grew up in the 90s like I did, remember him from Beverly Hills, 90210, put out a CD entitled Try My Love with the hot single, The Right Kind of Love, my favorite album cut, Do It to the Music, and he's been in Never Been Kissed hundreds of movies, commercials, and you probably had them on your wall thanks to 16, Tiger B, and some of the other 90s teams, Max. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. <laughs> Ermy Jordan and his uh, songwriting partner, Sam Ross. Welcome to Beyond the Top, gentlemen. Sam? Yes. Can, can, hey, you, can, you, can, you hear, can you hear us? I hear you. What was the question Jarrell just asked? I didn't hear it. So Did it we was say introduce just, ourselves? Yeah, so just the, just the intro. So Jeremy, tell Introduction. me. Yeah, so Jeremy, tell me how did you and Sam meet? Sam and I met in West Hollywood, California at about, I think 20, 2013, maybe 2013, Sam, if that sounds right. And uh, we, we hit it off outside a little place where people would gather. And um, I found out that he is an actual lyricist, a poet, a writer, someone who has been writing poems with photography that he took to all in his one little phone. He had a whole bunch of stuff he showed me. And I said to myself, I'm, I love music. I love to write and play, but why not collaborate with this man? And I had to convince him. I really had to, that I was professional about it and serious about it writing starting to write some songs with him and we wrote many songs since then actually but right off the bat uh Jarrell um it worked it worked that magic was there it worked and I was very fortunate to kickstart a little writing spiff off with Sam Ross right Sam that's right yeah yeah I say he uh costed me out in front of a building in West Hollywood <laughs> <laughs> All right, so yeah, he hustled I mean, me. He hustled me over. Right. So that's the best <laughs> way to song. Yeah. So tell us about the. Song. That's one of our songs. <laughs> yeah. So tell us about the songs you guys been working on, and for those of you that listen to the audio only version of the podcast, you're gonna get an audio only exclusive where we have their songs that's gonna be released on the same day as this interview airs. Great. Oh, that's excellent! Wow, yeah. that's really yeah, neat. So Thank you, Jerome. So I've been, well, who's talking about the songs first? You can go ahead and take it first, Sam. Then Jeremy, if you want to add on, you can take it after Sam. Yeah, absolutely. Sam, All right. Go ahead. So, so um, you know, I've been in recovery for 21 years and uh, I uh, have written numerous poems and inspirations about my life um, in order to heal mostly, but also to give it away to other people. Um, on my Facebook page in order to hopefully help others understand, you know, the process, but also maybe help them. Um, yeah. <clears throat> but mo more than anything, it's helped me. Um, so I started writing probably about, oh, 15 years ago and wrote all these poems and inspirations and just put them on Facebook and got a lot of feedback. And when I met Jeremy, um, he saw a lot of them and started to talk about, you know, collaborating. And um, we got together in my friend Regina's um, dining room in West Hollywood, which was, you know, a 1930s, you know, ramshackle place. And um, it had the most amazing acoustics. Um, and so we started... I sent him the first song called Abbott Kinney and um, I got to Hollywood after he finished it. He wouldn't play it for me over, you know, he wouldn't send it to me until I came to West Hollywood. And so he um, played it for me there in my friend Regina's dining room. And um, I like burst into tears because I never thought, you know, the, you never, you never think you're going to hear your words in song and um, I was just it hit me and it was like amazing 
And um, so we started to record in that dining room. And I think I sent you the original version of that in the dining room. It's the acoustic one um, that sounds like it's in, you know, live. And um, that's the best version as far as I'm concerned of the song. I also sent you the dance version um, that was done in the studio by, um, by Josh Earhart. He's, right, he, does, right, right. he does recording in West Hollywood. Um, I don't think I sent you the other versions we did of that um, just because it drags a little. <laughs> but, um, but the original in my friend Regina's dining room was like the best. It was just, he hit, he um, captured my words perfectly in song and articulated the sentiment of what I was feeling he he um delivered that to me um that was an amazing 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 experience and the dance yeah. version you know if you listen to it the other versions if they if you slow it down a lot um can be a little uh little hokey you know so and then we did um one more song crazy in the studio with josh um another song i wrote <clears throat> um and then um and all these songs were about, you know, lost love and all that stuff and feelings and working through emotions and all of that. And then we did a lot more um, in Regina's dining room in West Hollywood. My friend Regina O'Neill, I should mention her because she's a big part of all that process. And then we uh, came, we drove cross country in 2017 and uh, we made probably about four more songs in upstate New York, where I live, Cherry Valley, New York. And then Jeremy went to Washington, D.C., and he found a girl named Shana, who um, performed a song I wrote about my mother. And she delivered that incredibly. And I think I sent you that version as well. So you have the studio version of Crazy. Um, Nothing Ugly with Shana and Jeremy. Right. Jeremy um, produced that song as well. The other ones I helped pr- to produce, we produ- co-produced those. And then um, Abbott Kinney, which we did together. So you have, I think you have those three songs. And really they're all, they're all about, you know, my experiences through my recovery from drugs and alcohol and uh, being an adult child of alcoholics. Man, and poetry and music, a great combination like Reese's peanut butter cups with the chocolate and the peanut butter when you mix it together. Ooh, it's so good. And Jeremy, do you have anything you <laughs> want to add really quickly about the songs that you and Sam has produced before we get into the bulk of this interview? Uh, you're talking to me, right, Jarrell? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Jarrell. Yes, Reese's peanut butter cups. We've got chocolate and peanut butter. How about... um? like a um, oil and vinegar uh, dressing, you know, it's the same, when you shake it up, it's delicious, but alone it's, it's not right. so great. Right, right. Yeah, sh- Sam shook me up, Sam, Sam, he shook me and he said, you know what, with the talent you have, you've got to start do some, doing something with it. You've got to start like performing again, get, get back into your figure, uh, get off your butt and start, get out there and start, here, here's my, here's my poem, let's see what you can do with it. I got it, I got his poem. And when I got it over the phone, um, texted to me, I immediately took my phone and wrote each word out with pencil and paper so that I could put it on a music stand and just start strumming some chords to it, having getting an idea about Abbot Kinney. You know, I had to even, I, I live in LA, but I wanted to know more about Abbot Kinney. I wanted to know, I've been there maybe twice or three times, it's Venice kind of, right, Venice. Anyways, we'd go down there, we did a photo shoot down there we did a photo shoot with all the hundreds of murals Abbott Kinney actually has. It's a very, very artistic part of LA. It's somewhat like Soho in, in, in New York or like, you know, some of the great um, uh, places around the world where artists can just display through clothing, coffee, music and dance and dogs everywhere. I got the sense of Abbott Kinney and it's old. It was named after a person. It was actually, it wasn't Abbott Kinney. There actually was that. So, I, I got an idea for the the, the, the song. It's about love. It's about the almost like the um, uh, give and take of love. The song was 
and um, I found the chords, Jarrell. I found them, and I, I found the chorus first, and then I went, I found the verse, and then I had, I put it all together within like, I'd say about three or four weeks, maybe maybe a month. It was done, it was ready, I sent it. Like Sam said, I didn't, I didn't send it to me, right? I didn't send it to him. I waited until I came to LA, or when he came back, to, to present it to him in person in, in, the, in, the, in Regina's home there, her 30s, 1930s Art Deco style home there in her big like living room where there was no carpeting, lots of echo, the song, Sam, like I said, or like or Sam, like he said, he, he had tears in his eyes. And I know why, because his, his lyrics came to life in the song. It came to life and he loved that. He was moved by it. And that's, that to me, it, that to me makes, uh, makes the song a, a hit, a success, uh, was something with lasting value is when the, the writers come together and we're moved emotionally. We know other people will be too. So Sam really, he did it. I mean, he's amazing. Sam Ross is an amazing lyricist. Right. And <clears throat> you can hear this on the audio only version of the podcast, all of those songs that Sam mentioned at the top. And Sam, do you have anything else you want to add before you hop off? No, nothing more. Um, thank you, Jarrell. And uh, thanks, Jeremy. I'll talk to you later. You're welcome, Sam. All right, yep. thanks, Sam. You. Thank yep. you. Good luck. Yes. Bye. All right, thank you, Sam. Now, Jeremy, Chicago, Chicago born. Now, yes. Being in Chicago, Can I leave? did you cut your teeth um, doing local stage plays before you made the move out to Hollywood to bust the streets, acting and busting down casting agents? My first move, my first real move as a musician and/or actor dancer was in the House of God Church at Mooseheart, Illinois, in Aurora, Illinois. It's an orphanage, it's a child home. It's uh, the child, it's known as the Mooseheart, the child city. My first move was in the choir with other talented singers, uh, kids, children there uh, as well. The whole, the whole school itself had, everyone who was there was orphaned somehow, some way. But when we came together for things like choir or uh, entertainment, like dance class or athletics, even uh, academic 4.0 possibilities, every student took it seriously because uh, it was our way out of the uh, loss uh, that we had incurred from parents either leaving or passing and stuff like that. So what happened was a uh, choir was my, my first, uh, that's where I got my first taste of a uh, uh, not not only attention, but the power of music, you know, the power of it, the, the actual uh, um, meaning of it, you know, it was it was wonderful to to sing in church at, at Moosehart, Illinois. That's I credit Moosehart, Illinois for my first first move at all within uh, singing songwriting. Yes, absolutely. Mm, and yeah. I'm sh and I'm sure before you made the move out to LA, you were bumping WGCI out of Chicago and WBMX out of Chicago as well, because Chicago is known for Chicago House. Oh wait, hey, you got totally. But what about B96? Remember that? Pop WBBM B96. B96, you remember that? Yes, I remember B96. Drew? Yes, I remember. Damn, B96. Drew, that's good. I looked at Drew, I looked up B96 a few years ago. It's no longer there. This is like five years ago. I looked, just looked up B96 Chicago. It's not a station anymore. Wow. And then, <laughs> then going to give you guys a little bit of a backstory about uh, WLUP, The Loop. This station was infamous for the whole Disco Sucks promotion at the old Kaminsky Park when the White Sox played a doubleheader with the Detroit Tigers. So Steve Dahl, he had this promotion where if you brought your disco records in, you were going to get in for, I believe, 97 cents. And they tore the fill up so bad they had to cancel the doubleheader, and then that led to the demise of disco. No kidding. Yeah, yeah, man. I, yes. Yeah, that's, wow. that's, that's, I didn't that's, know that's, that. Yeah, that's 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 true right there. So when you made the move out west, what was that first audition like? Having to go in and sit, bring your profile shots, do your size, and thinking, man. I can beat this kid, I can beat this kid, but knowing that when you're auditioning until you build a rep where you don't have to audition for things, it's gonna be maybe you'll book something once and then there'll be a dry spell in between bookings. 
There are, and it's it's like little waiting periods before you develop and take this whole thing seriously. Parents have to approve, agent has to guide you, direct uh, 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 manager steps in. Um, maybe um, maybe I'm, uh, if you're under 18, you need guardianship. Uh, no kind of artist. Uh, uh, yeah, when you get an audition of any kind, it comes in your hand. There's like different ways to look at it. One is definitely do it. Don't turn it down. Don't think you're better than that. This is the way it goes to start them, right? Um, there are some auditions you get in your hands, scripts, sides that you don't agree with. And your parents say, absolutely not. I don't see you playing it. That's another way. Uh, they don't want their child to be portrayed that certain way. There, there's so many directions. The best thing I can say is um, um, go with your heart. Go with what you love. I mean... Um, I've acted some roles that to this day, I say, wow, what was I thinking? Well, I, I did it because my, my agency had suggested that if I'm to be represented by them and they're getting me this kind of work, I should not turn it down. I should do it. And I went that approach. It was interesting. It was, it was acting, but before the acting was, um, Music, and yes, as a kid, I left Chicago at about, I don't know, 17, 18, 19, like around that time, I, I, I left Chicago to uh, be brought to Los Angeles by a manager at the time named Peter Chivarelli. Peter said he was going to uh, uh, introduce me to um, Irving Azoff, who owns Giant Records, and they might have a song written by Robbie Neville. I was like, I don't know. Who Irving is, who Robbie Neville is, but I'm doing this. I'm def definitely taking the first class flight that he put, put me on with him from Chicago to LA. And when I reached LA, I immediately met Howard Kaufman and Irving Azoff. Um, Cassandra works for Irving. Cassandra's a great woman. Um, so I'm in their office. I do a little dance and sing uh, It's So Hard to Say Goodbye to Yesterday by Boys to Men. The same thing I did for Peter in Chicago, right? And he goes, in Chicago, just we're flying you to LA. So we flew to LA. I did the same thing for them in LA. Sang, it's so hard to say goodbye to yesterday by Boys to Men. Did some dance moves. I was literally under contract that, that day and um, uh, off to record The Right Kind of Love. Written and, uh, written and produced by Robbie Neville, uh, Lonnie Golden, and Tom Ferring. Uh, I forget, Tom, the, the third man involved. He's such a wonderful person too. I, anyways, I flew to New York to record it. Robbie wrote it. And it was, I'm flying around a lot for this first song for my career. And I'm just learning to be nice, be a gentleman, be, be also curious as to how this thing works, how this whole, you know, what's my real next move? Uh, what should I, you know, what advice can you give me to be better? You know, cooperative, I was kind. Um, and it was working with, with them. Um, you know, at that time when, when the right kind of love was made, Jarrell. Um, grunge was the hot music out at the, at the moment. Nirvana, um, Stone Temple Change, Pilots, Pearl maybe. Jam. Pearl Jam, yes. I was like trying to pull off a, an RB like soul, you know, I compared it to Hall and Oates kind of thing, you know what I mean? A Hall and Oates kind of vibe where I'm singing that I'm in with RB, the passion, the love, who I thank Malik Hart, Malik Hart for. Malik Hart, I grew up with. That church I first sang at in, in at Moose Heart in the choir, I got him to come to that church and sing a duet with me, a Christian duet in front of all the audience. He got me from opera and like standards into soul and gospel, literally overnight. I mean, I was, you know, he changed my style little, literally overnight. Malik Hart is his name, he's fabulous. So yeah, I, I, I go to New York, I record the right kind of love um, and then uh, I learned shortly after that it's going to be on a soundtrack for, I was thinking movie, right? They're like, no, a soundtrack for uh, Beverly Hills 90210, <laughs> which Tori Spelling, by the way, who introduced me to the world, I really accredit her for giving me fame because the way she did it and how popular she was and her dad, how, how influential he was, she introduced me at the jukebox and Tori Spelling, who I ran into years later, at 7-Eleven in Westwood, California. And I thanked her. I said, Tori, thank you so much. She was like, oh, Jeremy, it's okay. 
Do you remember Tori Spelling, Spelling uh, uh, Jarrell? Do you remember her? Yes, I do. And for those who don't know, her daddy, Aaron Sparin, Spelling, need I say more, Charlie's Angels, Dynasty, Fantasy Island, pretty much any big TV show in the 70s and the 80s, he had a hand in it. And also Tori Spelling, along with Brian Austin Green, both went on The Mass Singer at separate points. And now on 210 was the hottest show in town. And really, along with The Simpsons and Living Color and Married with Children, put Fox on the map. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Very successful. There's not one thing that Aaron Spelling was part of that wasn't on, uh, that wasn't successful. Everything he did, absolutely successful. You're right. He, he's, a, he's a legend. He, he's a real legend. He is. Yep. If you know the entertainment business, you know Aaron Spelling's name. Now, Giant Records, at this time, they were white hot. Of course, they had Color Me Bad, Jade, Good To Go. Yep. And they just had a knack. Didn't they, hey, Terrell, Terrell, didn't they also have uh, Christopher Williams? Um, Christopher Williams' first album was on Geffen, and then the second album came out under Uptown. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, but John, no, no, Giant Records, Giant Records, also uh, Jarrell. Yeah, they did the New Jack City soundtrack. Yeah, because New when Jack I City, yes. Yeah, because when I interviewed KT from Color Me Bad, he was saying that because I Want to Sex You Up was so huge for Color Me Bad that Cassandra and everybody at Giant had to rush them into the studio to put out the CMB album. Yeah. Everybody was just buying the single. Yes, that's true. That's so true. That's so true. Yep, absolutely. Um, Giant Records, I learned while in my travels as an artist under their beautiful label, and grateful to have been there. Um, Giant Records um, was affiliate. This is what I learned about the industry, the business side. They're, they're part, they were, um, it was called Giant Reprise. Now, what that means is Giant like, under the Reprise Warner Brother uh, umbrella, like under the umbrella of the major Warner Brother, like studio lot, and, uh, industry record labels there's different labels that fall underneath it and giant fell underneath the warner reprise so it was still part of warner brothers you see and then i learned uh, i got a book on irving azoff while i was there with him i studied irving azoff for a second he actually irving azoff in the 1970s uh turned mca around from a bankrupt to be doomed company into a hundred hundreds of million dollar worth company. The company was like three, four hundred million in a matter of a few years with him as the uh, uh, CEO, the manager of a, of a, of a MCA. Did you know that? Yeah, and he managed the Eagles in the 70s and Urban Azov was definitely raking in the bucks because of the success of Bobby Brown, New Edition, BBD, Jody Watley, the Jets, and all of the acts that were white hot during MCA's run in the mid to late 80s and early 90s in the R&B. Yeah. Yes. I think he managed the Eagles. I'm yeah. not kidding. The Eagles and Boz Scaggs, uh, Steely Dan, Fleetwood Mac. I mean, the, him and Irving Azoff and uh, uh, David Geffen were in competition with each other big time. They were like the, the two big, they were like, you know, it went down to either David or, or Irving. Uh, in, during the 1970s, and uh, they became good, really good friends uh, because of that. Mm, and he's referring to Mr. David Geffen of Geffen Records, for those that don't know, Asylum Records. And you mentioned Robbie Neville earlier. Robbie Neville, yes. big, biggest hit, Say La Vie, which was originally done by yeah. Bo Williams. He had this other track called What's It To You? And then another yes. track called For Your Mind, which a young Dallas Austin, before he started working with TLC, did the remix for. You're absolutely right. Yep. Good work, Jarrell. You do your you do your research. You do your background check. Very nice. Yeah. yeah. Of course. Um, right, now, some people tell me whenever I mention I've worked with Robbie Neville, they're like, "Oh, is that Aaron Neville's brother?" I'm like, <laughs> it's, "I've heard it so many times." I'm like, no, but they do have the same same last name. Aaron Aaron Neville is uh, a really good soulful singer as well. But Robbie Neville, I have to let you know the right kind of love. <clears throat> Robbie Neville changed my life with that song. He made me now to this very day try to find the right kind of love. 
And um, I, we can get into that if you want to. It's just such a beautiful thing. What it, it wasn't about the record sales. It wasn't about the time I sang it. It's, it's about now and it's, pro, it's prophetic. It's got like a, like a prophecy to it, trying to find or live the right kind of love. He wrote the lyrics, yes. He wrote the music. And, 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 and after the 80s run he had with C'est La Vie, he, from that point on in, into the producing realm, produced dozens of people. I mean, dozens upon dozens of artists have ended up in his home recording studio doing music that he hand wrote, music that he wrote to this very day. And he still does. Huge in Japan. Probably know it was very big in Japan, yeah. believe it or not. Yeah, cause I, yeah, cause I remember the video for "Right Kind of Love" premiering on 90210. This was back in the day where, in order a big for a big video to drop, they would world premiere it after a hot TV show, or in Michael Jackson's case, his videos would be on simultaneously at the same time. Right, and hey, Michael Jackson in, in uh, "Beat It," the song "Beat It," he's got one of the greatest lines I've ever heard in music, which is, "No one likes to be defeated." No one who who likes to be defeated. I don't think anyone really does. No, isn't no. that a, Michael Jackson? Why, why you brought Michael Jackson? I wanted to just say that. Yeah, no, nobody likes to be defeated at all. So now the, the song hits. It's beamed nationwide, and you're in all these teen magazines alongside right. the kids on the block, Jonathan Taylor Thomas, Andrew Keegan, Jeremy Jackson from Baywatch. Now, was it pretty much kind of the same cycle when you do these photo shoots and do those little fluff questionnaires when they ask, what's your ideal girl? What's your favorite food? And all the stuff that yes. you for teen girls. Yes, I remember to this day, my answer for what was my favorite kind of cookie it is true to this day, oatmeal raisin. That is my favorite cookie. When I was asked that question, being a pop star, I thought it was so goofy. I thought teen, 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 teen idol, teen beat, tiger beat, whoever was asking me this, I'm like, why do they want to know what kind of cookies I like? But to this day, um, that's such an innocent, very tactful question to ask a young artist is what kind of cookies they like to eat. And um, there's, nothing, um, there's nothing corrupt about that at all. It's a, it's a cookie. And I was just, it was, it was what, a, what a time it was to shoot for those magazines. Yes, um, I was grateful to be part of it. I had family and friends that collected the magazines I had been on. Uh, I learned about the other popular artists of the time through looking through the magazine, even, you know, artists that were up and coming or new. And, um, and then back in school, uh, before I was even in the magazines, uh, girls would carry them around and, uh, you know, Tiffany was a big, do you know Tiffany the artist was, when I was in high school, grade school, high school, junior high, Tiffany was the um, top like uh, uh, personality to shoot at the time. She was absolutely huge in where I, where I grew up, Tiffany, absolutely huge. Mm -hmm. And girls wanted to be like her, the cassettes were, multiple cassettes were in the classroom each day in the girls' purses, even, even boys. And um, uh, Tiffany was just like the, on the front cover for so long, I was like, I was like, I had no idea I was gonna end up possibly doing something like that to a smaller degree. I'm not as big as Tiffany, but to a smaller degree, um, I uh, uh, ended up here and there on the cover, but yeah, Tiffany, I mean, the ripped jeans, the 19, you know what I'm talking about? The ripped jeans, Jarrell, yeah. the, the, you know, the feathers in the hair and, Poofy hair. Yeah, a whole hair. bunch of Aquanet yeah. was used and she made her bones yeah. by touring malls across America. <laughs> and also a little fun fact for you guys, New Kids on the Block, when they were coming up, opened for Tiffany. And then when they hit their popularity, they ended up doing another tour the following summer, but they were co-headliners. Yeah. So that kind of leads me to my next question. New Edition, Bobby Brown, New Kids on the Block, or Troop have any influence on you at all for your style and sound? Bobby Brown, Bobby, Bobby Brown, Bobby Brown, yeah. Bobby Brown had a huge influence. Yeah, New Edition, Bobby Brown's solo career. Um, uh, every little step you take, every little step. 
<laughs> but that just goes to show you the power of LA and Babyface, where they were able to have that clean, smooth pop sound, but it was R&B enough to where it was acceptable for both the R&B and the pop audience. And Jimmy Jam, Terry Lewis also had a good knack for that as well with their work with Alexander O'Neill, Sherelle, and later Janet Jackson. And then Marie Starr, who uh, managed or wrote for the uh, New Kids on the Block, right? Um, Maurice Stark put them together and uh, managed them. And then he discovered New Edition three years prior to putting together New Kids in 1984. Oh, wow. Wow, that's incredible. Um, there's also... Um, there's also... Uh, let me see here now. 1980s, there is somewhat huge, oh, Prince, Prince, anything Prince did or wrote or was part of, I would immediately try to get my hands on. Ever since buying his Purple Rain, Prince and the Revolution cassette with the motorcycle on the front, mm -hmm. you know, I, I, I got into his voice early and I was moved by it. And I was very grateful to have taken a liking to his style. But Jarrell, I learned probably a year after I had the cassette that all the guitar playing on the album too was done by Prince too. And, and on top of that, I have Nothing Compares to You by Sinead O'Connor as another, another cassette. I look on the, the credits, Prince wrote that song for her, Nothing Compares to You. Did the guitar track on his music itself and sang too. I was like, and produced it too. I'm like, if I could only get a tap into a bit of this, please, you know. Tell me, can Prince give me give me a blessing or some of your give me some of your juice, your love, please, and forgive me, you know, if I'm weird about you know Prince. Prince did, I believe. He influenced me huge, huge, and um, um, you know, and then then hearing uh, uh, David Bowie. David Bowie in the 1980s. I uh, got the Let's Dance uh, cassette. Loved every song on that cassette to this day. It's one of my favorite cassettes, the David Bowie um, cassette. And um, David Bowie, uh, I, I was compared to a lot. Believe it or not, I had people on the street or in Hollywood say, you look a lot like David Bowie. Even. You look kind of like it. I'm like, well, what an honor. What an honor for you to think that, you know? Right. Uh, what an honor for me to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And you mentioned David, David Bowie. Bowie. Yeah. You mentioned David Bowie and uh, on the album Young Americans and the track of the same name, a young pre solo Luther Vandross cut his teeth singing backgrounds for David Bowie. Before he did his solo? Yeah. Before, before he did his solo career, right around when he put out the Never Too Much album, Luther Vandross cut his teeth doing backgrounds. Yeah. And a lot of famous singers, for those of you that don't know, that later became big names, cut their teeth doing background vocals, singing for sessions or commercials, jingles. Hey, hey check this out, check this out, check this out. Wanna hear something funny? Go ahead. When I, when, I, when I went to Nashville to record a song called Wanna Girl, remember I had the video, it was mm -hmm. on MTV, it, it went well. Uh, years later, someone said, you know, before you sing it, oh, no, 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 here it is, here, here it is, I'm sorry. I'm gonna get this right. I'm in the studio recording um, Wanna Girl and who comes in to sing the background vocals on the song is um, Trey Lorenz. Mariah Carey's and backup singer. Keith, Keith is like, Keith, 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 Keith uh, Thomas, the producer, producer, writer said, well, you know, Trey sang the song already and made a video for it already. <laughs> I'm like, well, I'm doing it again, huh? And they're like, yeah, we're gonna see if it has more success with you this time. But Trey Lorenz, from that point ends up with Mariah Carey singing uh, I'll Be There, the Michael Jackson re 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 remake. And he just blows everyone away. And by the way, Trey Lorenz singing on that MTV, you know, I'll Be There version with Mariah Carey was the same kind of vocal power, amazement, and um, uh, just mesmerizing background vocals in his pitch perfect riffs and his pitch perfect um, uh, like 
display. I mean, I was, I was like, there's no one that I know who can sing like that. You know, only maybe maybe Prince can, but my God, Trey Lorenz is very big, very yeah, big. Trey Lorenz, in, in my, in, yeah, Trey Lorenz, a bad boy, someone to hold, dope record, and he's still with Mariah to this day. Now I want to go back to Giant a little bit talk about jade now i had a chance to interview joy from jade and she was telling me that don't want don't walk away was originally intended for stephanie mills but for some reason or another it didn't happen jade ended up cutting it and it became a crossover smash form so tell me about your interactions with jade i uh jade was on the same lo label uh yes giant records um um whenever i'd go to the office or call or be in LA or Chicago. <clears throat> um, uh, everyone was there. No one was like unavailable. Everything was all, all, actually all my needs were met. And then um, I uh, uh, had there was a surprise. Uh, uh, Cassandra put together. Cassandra Mills put together a, a little event um, that some of the artists on her the label Giant can be part of like a giant like concert. Um, some labels do package their artists in the same event for like a night. Um, and Giant did that with a show in New York. Uh, it was, a radio station was included. I forget which one, Jarrell. But what happened was um, we got to take a trip to Niagara Falls because we were right near the Canadian border with New York. We were either in can Canada or New York. And um, Cassandra had us all meet at Niagara Falls, and I met Jade there, but also so cute and young and um, kind, very kind, you know, my label mate, I was glad to meet them, you know, just like when I met Color Me Bad, when I met Color Me Bad, I was, I was, I was just, I was touched, and uh, I was uh, humbled by Color Me Bad, yeah, Co Color Me Bad, uh, Brian Adams, all right, sorry, Brian uh, Abrams, Brian Abrams is, in my phone, I could call him now. I could call him like uh, uh, tomorrow. I could, and uh, him, his wife Kim is very nice too. They're 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 very kind and nice, uh, Jarrell. But yeah, uh, Jade, I met uh, at Niagara Falls. Mm. Now, did CMB yeah. success with "I Want to Sex You Up," "I Adore Me or More," and that whole CMB album set you up quite nicely for the release of "Try My Love," since that's the same vein you were going in for that pop R and B sound. Yeah, I was going for the pop R and B R and B sound, R pop R and B sound. But um, Brian Abrams took the cake. There was, there was no way to compete with him. And not that I was trying to, or I wasn't like becoming. I wasn't realizing Jarrell, Jarrell. I wasn't realizing that. Uh, oh, we have to compete on, under the same label. You know, we all have to. It wasn't like that at first. Besides, Color Me in Bad, I think it sold tens of millions of albums. Tens of millions, maybe 20, 30 million albums they sold, maybe more. I don't even know, but they far outdid my sales. Um, and Brian Abrams, like all the other Met band members, deserve quite a quite respect for that, you know, uh, respect. And also, Brian Abrams is uh, 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 she's a very powerful singer, very powerful, very very moving, powerful, soulful, and. Uh, um, weren't you, Jarrell, yourself? Weren't you, uh, weren't you like surprised to see who the singer Color Me Bad was when you first heard them and then you saw them? W weren't you, Marcia, surprised? Yeah. Or did I you say, oh, I, I knew it was Brian Abrams? Yeah, I, I, I was surprised because, you know, when I Want to Sex You Up came out, I was six years old at the time and it was everywhere on radio, on TV, crossover, on BET, yeah. MTV, Soul Train. And to see a group of guys from Oklahoma that could sing their faces off and then the look be multiracial, it was like, man, this is going to hit. Yeah. And, and it worked to perfection. It did. It did. It really did. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I, it's amazing. Uh, I think on the label, uh, Giant Records had a um, band called The Shore, who I have a friend in that band, his name's John Wilmer, he's the uh, drummer for the band. He was signed to Giant Records too. I never met him when I was signed, but 
later on in passing in, in Los Angeles, ran into him, we talked. He's like, oh, I was in a Giant Records too. It's like, you were, what was the band? It was The Shore, it was called The Shore. Wow. And, and they're um, uh, like a, kind of like an Oasis sound, sounding band, Oasis from England. Mm -hmm. They're like that, like, like pop, like, you know, alternative, alternative rock. Right. Yeah. Right. And I can remember uh, pre-successful Blake Shelton released his first album on Giant, I believe, his first country record, I believe. Blake did? I think so. I want to say don't. Oh, wow. But I believe he did. And then do you know if Jamie Walters was signed to Giant? That's a good question. He he came out with a hit song during the right kind of love. Yeah, he, Jamie Walters. Yeah, he, was on, he, was on the, he was on the chart. He made the charts. He made the charts, Jarrell. Yeah, yeah. Jeremy Walt Jamie Walters did how how do you talk to an angel, which was the setup song for his show The Heights, which aired on Fox as well around the same time. Now on right. tour, show was out. That's true. That's true. Right. Yep. And can you tell yeah, me? Yeah, he was he signed a giant. I mean, he could have been. I think he, so. he was. He was also. He, he was. Uh, he was also. Wait, his song was on a soundtrack too for a TV show. You're right, Joel. Right? Yeah, I think I think it was either on Nano Two and No soundtrack or for the Heights soundtrack. Because this was back. How about Melrose Place? Was it, was Melrose, it Melrose Place, Joel? It was either one of one of those. Either Nano Two and No yeah. Heights or Melrose Place. One of those three. Right. One of those three. So, can you tell me about your interactions with Good to Go? They were signed to Giant as well around the same time as you. Had a big hit single with Never Satisfied. They were managed by Hiram Hicks, who also managed BB. I know Hiram. And uh, I, Hiram. you could check on YouTube my throwback interview with Natalie Fernie from Good to Go. And I thought they were so dope. Good to go, yeah. Yeah. Um, wow. I can't be surprised to know these label uh, uh, artists. Um, good to go. I, yes, I heard many times. Uh, I also, I was watching Giant uh, Records while being an artist represented by them grow and I watched them start to sign other artists. And it went from a few to many, like within a year. And um, uh, it was personal to see a, a record label grow and uh, take on what, what they thought would be uh, 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 artists to, to, to be remembered or known or, or, or love even, mostly love, love these artists. Um, Giant Records um, was probably around Jarrell, I'm saying, I'm gonna guess for like eight years. I don't know if I'm right, I'm not, I don't know if that's correct. I'm just saying Giant might've been around for eight years. And within those eight years, who did they sign? So many, right? Mm -hmm. Who did they let go? Others too, they let me go too, you know? You, know, you sign, you let go, you, you have to move on. Your business and you're, you're about uh, getting getting your artists out there. And I, I, when I was let go from Giant Records uh, for a combination of things, if you want to get into that, I can. But, yeah, go ahead, um, go ahead, it's your truth. Yeah, um, I didn't, one is they didn't sell as much as they thought I would. Uh, I would, I, would, I had, um, I had, um, uh, from what I was told to make the three music, three music videos and touring me and traveling me to different radio st stations. Uh, I believe they had said it cost about a million dollars to do it uh, all within one year of everything I was doing. And, um, uh, that expense had to be paid off somehow and, and you know record label gets their money back and then the sales of the album didn't do as great as they thought it would so um it was it was less than gold i sold i sold probably around uh 350 400 thousand albums maybe wow. you know uh, that's pretty good but it's not color me bad which is signed 30 million you know or 20 million i don't I, i'm just i'm color me bad was in the millions they sold. They did make the money back. Uh, and they were they were the pride and joy of Giant at the time. Uh, but, uh, but Cassandra Mills takes things differently. If I must say, she wasn't Irving Azoff, who's very business savvy, sharp and smart. Cassandra sees all her artists as loving children of hers almost. So that's how I got to meet all the other members because Cassandra wanted us to be to, to know each other and not see. 
who's going to succeed or fail at the label. But get us involved at different events. Cassandra would do that. She thought about uh, making a family of the label rather than um, the success or failure of a, of a, of a project. Cassandra Mills is a special woman. She is. She really is. Mm, she definitely is. Do you think what contributed to the album not selling as they projected was the tide of the time in music, how teen pop was kind of on the way out, and of course grunge was high at its peak, and then of course New Kids was yeah. facing a strong backlash as well? So that's the other thing um, that, they, that the label had said is that the new sound of grunge may have overshadowed my efforts as a as uh, singing R&B um, because uh, grunge was breaking through with Nirvana, Pearl Jam, and, and countless others. Um, and uh, that's the new sound. That's what everyone's going for. That's what everyone loves. Uh, so my, uh, my sound is not, um, uh, it's not as popular anymore. I mean, they, they basically said it comes and goes. It comes back away and it comes back and it goes away but right now it, it's gone away and now we're, we're having to compete with a, a band named Nirvana and I'm like oh I guess so yeah Nirvana huge huge right and it was huge funny that at this same time that the Trauma Love album came out that an infamous businessman out of Orlando saw what New Kids was doing and said hey I'm gonna put together a group like New Kids, and you know who I'm talking about. I'm not gonna say his name. He has since deceased. And Backstreet Boys, they already released We've Got It Going On in the US in 93. It tanked here, but it exploded in Europe. They ended up cutting their teeth overseas for about maybe three to four years before they broke back big in America around 97. And then later NSYNC will follow their same route. So what was your take when you saw that teen pop movement come back around in the mid to late 90s with Hanson, Backstreet Boys, and NSYNC? It came back around, you see? Uh, the, the pop, uh, the pop uh, uh, sound never goes away it doesn't go away because it's popular that's what pop means it's popular boys and girls love pop music bobby brown like when i listen to him <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah that don't be, be like cruel that. yeah that don't be cruel album just to let you guys know how much that album sold it went diamond which means that it sold 10 million records it was the number one best-selling album of 1989 crossover smash bobby brown was to me he paved the way for what was to later come with usher chris brown pretty much every male r b singer of the 90s and 2000s since bobby brown pretty much set the standard for that whitney houston's got a beat though she outsold him 10 times. Whitney Houston went beyond Diamond Drill. Mm, yeah. I oh, mean, my God. I, I Holy mean, cow. So she, look course. what she did. My gosh. Yeah. And to just think about that time period, how regardless of what genre, you had stars littered everywhere and your top 40 radio station was literally like your CD being put on shuffle where you could just play it and just let it go all the way through because who would have thunk it that Nirvana out of Seattle would be considered pop. And then later on, Dave Grohl, who was the drummer in Nirvana, would find his own band, Foo Fighters. And then everything that came yes. out of there with Pearl Jam, Alice in Chains, yes. Garden, Soul Asylum, Seven Mary Three. I could go on down the list of all the grunge acts that came out of the Pacific Northwest during that period. Bobby Brown is Bobby Brown is cool by me. That is for sure. What what a talented. Dancing to his dance moves, his, his old step on stage, his old like, his old uh, attitude, his old clothing, his hairdo, the hairdo, wasn't that? that so was the Gumby, the, the Gumby was, haircut. Yeah, man, and yeah, it's crazy yeah, to yeah, and it's crazy to think about with New Edition how all six members had success outside of the group, came back to reform, had more success out of the group. And we can say today that pretty much every boy group pretty much had the template from New Edition and pretty much just followed it to the T. Yeah, that's true. Right. Um, do you know? Do you know an artist 
named Chucky Booker? Of course, Chucky Booker. Now, I'm going <laughs> to give you a little backstory about Chucky Booker. I had a chance to interview Yeah, tell me. Along with uh, Alan, Steve, John John, and Rodney B from the group Troop. For those of you that don't know, Troop, R&B group out of Pasadena, California, remade the Jackson 5, All I Do Is Think Of You, Spread My Wings. Now, Spread My Wings, when I interviewed Chucky and when I interviewed Rodney, Steve, and John John, they confirmed this story, that Chucky Booker's song, Turned Away, was originally supposed to go to Troop. But what happened was Chucky Booker played it for Sylvia Rome, who was head of Atlantic Records at the time. And she told Chucky, this is going to go on your album. And he tried to convince her, no, this is going to be for Troop. And she was like, no, this is going for you. So once he told Troop that she wouldn't give up Turn Away for you guys, they were like, we want a song similar. And that's how Spread My Wings for Troop came about. Nice. Yeah. Do you remember, uh, Jarrell, do you remember Ready for the World? Of course, Ready for the World out of the Midwest, repping Flint, Michigan. They were alongside of everything that came out of Minneapolis, followed that whole sound, had big hits such as. Hey, no, but hey, Jarrell, not to interrupt you, in Minneapolis, that's where Prince was. I swear. Yeah, yeah, Prince from yeah, Minneapolis. He was in, he was... Yes, he was. Chase the Park Studios in, uh, I, I believe, Minnesota. Mm -hmm, that's right. And uh, can you tell me about your performance on the Mickey Mouse Club and interacting with people that would later become future stars like Justin Timberlake, Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Ryan Gosling, yes. JC from Insane? Yes, the uh, Mickey Mouse Club. Um, um, uh, Cassandra said to me, You better not turn this down. I said, I won't, I'll do it. Um, I was kind of debating whether I should or not. My, uh, my attitude at that time was I was a little bit more mature and, and, and like uh, more accomplished than being on the Mickey Mouse Club. I don't, this, is, this is crazy, I don't need to do a kid show. And they were like, no, yes you do. And I'm like, uh, and they're, not, they're like, you're not gonna say no to us either because you're gonna do it. And I was like, you're right, I'm not gonna say no to you, Cassandra. I guess I'll do it. So here I am at the, at the show. And uh, yes, the artists from, uh, the, I mean, the artists from that, that show's cast uh, until now is unbelievable. It was, uh, that year was either Britney Spears, Justin Timberlake and Christina Aguilera were the year before after, after I was there. I was there when they were all like kind of moving and breaking around in that Mickey Mouse Club and, and then, and then uh, leaving and, and starting their own careers. and. Absolutely incredibly talented, all of them. Not even, even the ones that I don't remember who were part of the cast were talented too. Um, uh, and it is an honor to do the Mickey Mouse Club because it's been around for many years. Um, really, really only children and parents watch it and it's G-rated. There's nothing risque or you know controversial about the Mickey Mouse Club at all. So uh, matter of fact, it's one of the more wholesome things you can actually do. Want to do something? Mickey Mouse Club is a very wholesome uh, show to be a part of, you know. And uh, it's Disney, and everything that Disney does turns to gold, you know. Everything from Disney, from their TV shows, artists making albums and movies, animation. Disney is just an honor to be a part of. I, I, part of. Glad I didn't turn it down for right. Right, actually. Right. So how did you be able to find that balance of I want to be taken seriously as an artist and not be seen as a teeny bop act? It was probably when I got my Chinese flying dragon tattoo on my right arm in London. I said, I'm tired of being the, 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 the blonde head like tan or just just this pop. I, I do something different. And I, I told my manager I was stepping out for a couple hours. I had already planned and, and made an appointment at the tattoo shop down the street, Jarrell. Uh, and then when I came back, he was like, well, where'd you go? What'd you do? And I said, don't tell my management, but I, I got a tattoo. And he said, oh, no. He goes, that's the one thing they told me that, to tell you not to do. And I forgot to tell you, you actually got a tattoo. And I'm like, yeah. He goes, oh, they're gonna be pissed. They're gonna be pissed. That was one thing I did. Second thing I did, it was shooting with Bruce Weber for Interview Magazine in New York. 
Um, they, you know, one thing the label always told me is not to get tattoos or take your clothes off or go too crazy with what you say and, you know, kind of keep your head up when you walk and, and smile. And now I have my clothes off in the photo shoot with the tattoo on. And, and um, I, the feedback from the label was, you know, that um, I might be uh, rebelling or not uh, uh, respecting their, their direction. And that was not, it was, it wasn't, uh, it led to, to, to my demise later on, but you're right. I mean, record labels do sit you down if you're an artist to a degree or not, how, how much every success you have, sit you down and try to coach you, tell you what you need to do for your image, like a publicist or like a, you know, someone will sit down and say, there's some things you, we want you to do and definitely not to, you've got to listen to us because you're signed to our label. So it was, it was like that. It was, they, they had told me not to get tattoos. They had told me not to take my clothes off in a photo shoot. I don't know why I went against it though, Jarrell. I did. Right. I did. I, and I think that, that's your, does that answer your question? Yeah, about, yeah, about yeah. That? Yeah, because that whole teen idol image is good after a while, but as you start to get older, you want to say, hey, I'm not this same teen anymore. I want to be taken seriously as an adult because I think every teen idol kind of goes through this where I'm only going to be hot for X amount of time. And then the next one is going to come along. My poster is going to come down. A new poster is going to go up. And then it's going to be game over for me. So how did you end up getting the role and never been kissed with Drew Barrymore? By auditioning. By auditioning. At that point, I'd done probably, I don't know, uh, let me see Jarrell. Maybe maybe eight movies, and maybe less. I don't know. Um, and I wasn't the kind of actor that was offered a role uh, and offered a salary to do that role. I hit big like Ed Norton did. Um, I I had to audition still, and I auditioned for Drew, Drew Barrymore herself. She's very special. She's professional she um, is forgiving uh, she is uh, smart uh, she brought a cast together that was stellar and many spun off to do amazing things it was James Franco's first movie never been kissed his very first movie and he's done a I don't know 50 films since then or something like that so it's like James Franco's special he, 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 he gave me the time of day to meet up with him many times for birthdays and or coffee. And he was so kind, Jarrell. Uh, he has, he, he signed an a autograph picture for Kelly Lopez, my friend Kelly Lopez in the Make-A-Wish Foundation. She contacted me, said she wants this picture. Do I know him? I said, I kind of do. So I arranged it. She loves James. She thought James Franco was the best. Even better than she knew me longer, but she loved him more. And David Lipper, too, the other actor, talented coach to acting coach actor, David Lipper. Absolutely amazing. She, Kelly loved him too. So. But um, yeah, um, never been kissed. Uh, shot in LA and Chicago. And they flew us to Chicago. I got my family on the set to meet Drew Barrymore. They were blown away because we saw her in ET. I don't know, was it 1983, Jarrell E.T.? Or yeah, it was somewhere in, the, somewhere in the early 80s, like 82, 83, I want to say. Yeah, and uh, when we saw E.T. twice in the drive-thru, not just once, Drew Barrymore was a huge fan of ours. She was a child. We, we were children and loved Drew Barrymore. And then to be years later in her movie, kind of came back around. She's so, so special. Right. So how many auditions did you have to do before you did the screen test with uh, Drew? Two. Two auditions. Two auditions. Yeah. And, and, and does that... And they asked me, when they, cast, when they cast me, Jarrell, when they cast me, they said, we're going to give you the script to read uh, now, but in one of the scenes, there's a flashback scene, and we have to find someone who kind of looks like you. Do you know anyone who kind of looks like you? I said, yes, I do. Denny Kirkwood. Denny Kirkwood was my roommate at the time. He kind of looked a lot like me, and she cast him. She cast him in the flashback scene. Yeah. Yeah. That's Denny Kirk was a very Denny Kirk was a very talented actor. 
Nice. Now I want to back up and talk about the Trauma Love album again for a bit. There's this album cut that is a favorite of mine on the album that I think should have released as a single. Do it to the music. How did that record come about? With Val B. Shorter. Yeah. How did, how did you link up with Val B? Through Cassandra. Cassandra Mills. And Val B. Shorter was a legend, you know, in, in the 1990s. From the 80s, his whole like ghetto R&B smooth like sound. He's now a radio personality out here in Silver Spring. I have yet to meet him again. We have contacted the radio studio to let him know I'm out here. It's up to him, of course. I might've been rude to him in the past. I hope not. He, he saw me now. He saw me losing my appreciation for what I had a little bit. Right. He's, he's sad, sad to see that because it was a lapse in my management now. We, we had a problem and I was distancing myself further. From, from that rock solid, what was to be rock solid success, but I'll be sure when he worked with me in New York, again, Giant flew me out to work with him in New York. Two of his songs got on my album and uh, I got to be produced by him in the studio. He got a sound out of me that's incredible. I don't know if I could ever sing it again like that again. He just moved me that at those two days in the studio, three days in the studio, probably he moved me so like passionately with this like this uh, R and B sound. It's just bigger than normal. It's pretty. But I'll be sure. Yes, an absolute gentleman. Absolute. You know, mm -hmm. he's the kind of he's the kind of person that would, um, if he sees you turning sour, he'll come put his hand on your shoulder and say. What do you need right now? What do you want me to do? Hungry? Want to go out? Want to take a break? Want to come back tomorrow? What? what I want to help you out. And I'll be sure. And he's real soft with it. He's got soft hands. Right. Yes, real soft hands. Right. Because if you think about Al B's production, it was right around the same time he was doing his stuff with Jodeci and Tevin Campbell. Tevin Campbell is one of my favorites. Um, what's his song, uh, Jarrell? One of the big ones. But he had, um, you have what's it called? It, you have goodbye. You have tell me what you want me to do, which was produced by Narada Michael Walden. You have round and right. round. I'm ready. Can we talk? Can we have one cut on the album that you wish Giant would have released as a single, but because labels are like, no, these are the two or three singles we're gonna go with. But you're like, but this one right here is the one that I want as a single. Um, it would have been Try My Love. As the first single, first single drill? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I- The first gonna, single? Yeah, because I can remember Try My Love being played in a movie called Airborne. And it was the first- Yeah, you're right. That Jack Black was in. <laughs> and also Seth Green was in it too as well, if it's- <laughs> Yes. Yeah, man. So, I, yeah. hey, that's what we do here at Beyond the Album Cover. We do our research, we do our homework, and it's all all real, no preservatives. So, being in Hollywood, seeing everything from the movie and the music side, how tough is it to navigate it as a minor, knowing that, okay, I maybe still have school to do, and then you get asked to go to these parties. And then as we all know, certain things are offered to you and it's easy to get. So how do you manage to stay sane and keep the noise and the distractions out when you're in a business where it pays to be seen? It does. I mean, being seen can uh, uh, lead to a distraction because um, well, I mean, loyal fans of any artist will always be loyal and be there for the person that they're a fan of. They don't like to see a rise of the image and stardom of the artist and then fall and maybe never get back up again. Fans are still always there. Um, the distraction is... Uh, 
shouldn't be worthy of more airtime on the news than the rise, right? I mean, I disagree. I think the distractions should not be made uh, an issue, you know? Um, yeah, I don't want to see someone's mistake uh, be forever burdening the artist and make mistakes, we do. Um, and um, uh, it's distracting when you're, you're compared to your uh, height with your bottom and um, um, it's not about rising and falling then. It's, it's about probably about just loyal fans that really are there for their artists. They never distract. Um, you know, Michael Jackson has millions of fans still, that's for sure. Elvis does. Elvis has millions of fans still. Um, and the true fan of any of these artists is interested in the lyrics and content and memories. Um, you know, they're not, they're not gearing up for the, they're not preparing to get a kick out of, or ent even entertained by a terrible story that can happen to an artist, you know, um, you know, um, these, uh, you know, the stars can be cleaned, you know, uh, and, and forgiven and recovered and, or, accepted you know um, right. by their fans true fans i have a japanese fan Jarrell. she's been there this whole time she's always contacted me on facebook or something she loves she uh, she's just hugely a fan and it's just amazing to see how how fans could actually keep you happy still i'm happy you know i got a couple fans here and there still yeah, yeah. is that a distraction my point is Jarrell, my point is just fans are not distractions. Fans, fans are. Yeah, because fans are not distractions. Of course not, because um, when I think about all of the teen stars in your era, of course this is pre-social media, and I think about all of the young stars that are up and coming now. How it's more intensified because you have social media where everybody's a critic, everybody has an opinion, and your mistakes are magnified tenfold because you have the click of a button. I met, I, met, I met Tevin Campbell in, in L.A. I met Tevin Campbell in L.A. I met uh, uh, Debbie Gibson in L.A. They knew who I was. I didn't have to tell them. Tevin goes, Jeremy Jordan. Oh, my God. Right kind of love. MTV. Debbie Gibson. Acting class. Jeremy Jordan. Right kind of love. Debbie Gibson. Uh, 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 Tevin Campbell knew me. <clears throat> and you know what? It was an honor to be that, that they said that because I really looked up to the both of them. Really, right, I did. Yeah, because they know music. I mean, they're into it. They're listening to the radio. They're watching MTV. They love it. Mm, everybody was listening to everybody, and with Brian Austin Green on now two and zero, I didn't know that he was real heavy into music until he put out an album and performed on Soul Train. Now, did you know prior to that he was going to really dabble into music like he did? No, I didn't know that. Um, but I do know he put out an album. You're right. Um, why not? Why not? He's an artist. He's got fans. He can like, he can create a, a, a sound and music. And, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. if he's got you know, uh, two million fan uh, fan letters in the in the office. He's got two million fans that could be moved by his music. So, right. yeah, he was smart. It was smart of him to even try to sing or do sing or feel that success as a singer. And um, I commend artists that do that. It's a crossover, right? It's a crossover, right? Yeah. Drill, crossover from this to that, right? Yeah, to have that synergy. Yeah, from... How about Drill? Drill, Drill, how about Drill? Drill, how about crossing over from acting to directing? Nice crossover there, huh? Yeah. Why not, right? Yeah. Come on. Why not? Because you're on the hottest TV show. Let's get you in Definitely. the studio, put out an album so that we can have synergy from the music and the show. And I felt one actor that should have released the album when. He was white hot, was uh, Darius McCrary from Family Matters because he could sing his butt off. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, because um, on some of those clips from Family Matters when he was singing with Shanice and Tracy Spencer, I was like, his voice to me sounded very similar to Johnny Gill. And I was thinking somebody at Family Matters dropped the ball and said, hey, we need to put him in the studio to cut an album so that we can have more synergy with the show. Feel that success as a singer. And um, I commend artists that do that. It's a crossover, right? It's a crossover, right? Yeah. Drill, the, crossover the, this to that, right? Yeah, to have that synergy. Yeah, cross, from, how, about, how about Drill? Drill, how about Drill? Drill, how about crossing over from acting to directing? Nice crossover there, huh? Yeah. Why not, right? Yeah. Come why, on. Why not? Because you're on the hottest TV show. Let's get you Definitely. in the studio, put out an album so that we can have synergy from the music and the show. And I felt one actor that should have released the album when. He was white hot, was uh, Darius McCrary from Family Matters because he could sing his butt off. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, because um, on some of those clips from Family Matters when he was singing with Shanice and Tracy Spencer, I was like, his voice to me sounded very similar to Johnny Gill. And I was thinking somebody at Family Matters dropped the ball and said, hey, we need to put him in the studio to cut an album so that we can have more synergy with the show. Can we talk folk? Can we talk? Can we talk? Can we talk for a minute? Girl, I want to know your name. Can we talk? Can we talk for a minute? <laughs> so I had heard that originally Can We Talk was supposed to go to Usher when he was recording his debut album with Ellie and Babyface. Now, I don't I don't know how true it is, but I heard that that was originally supposed to go to Usher and somehow, of course, Tevin ended up recording it and it became a big smash hit for Tevin. Now, after you did Never Been Kissed, was there ever a point where you said, I want to take a break from this roller coaster, get off, step away from everything with Hollywood and live out of the public guy for a minute. Yeah, yeah, I, I ran into a spot like that. Um, I uh, had to recol rec recollect on, on what I was doing and also where I saw myself going. Um, and uh, after never been kissed, I, uh, I uh, was soon uh, like soon after let go from my agency, which was at that time, William Morris. And when, when they let me go, uh, I had no label signed to, I had no uh, acting agency to be uh, represented by. So I just, uh, what I did is I, uh, oh, Jarrell, I just kind of, there's a saying by John Genet. He said that he's a French writer. He said that our dreams are sometimes nursed in darkness. And I was going dark. I was going really dark so that I can uh, find something to birth anew from it. You know, all my pain and uh, all my pain and all my um, uh, all my pain, all my shame and misery. Um, led to me kind of picking up the guitar and starting to songwrite and play seriously. Uh, the guitar I would go to when I was really lost and uh, uh, hurting, I would, uh, yeah. I should have a good mm, So it was very therapeutic uh, for you? Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Jarrell, yeah. Jarrell, Jarrell. Are you gonna um can you do me there? Are, yeah. are you gonna edit this? Are you gonna edit this whole thing? So tell me a little bit about your two special friends in your life, Jennifer Lewis and Kelly Lopez. Jennifer Lewis is a make-a-wish child from Tennessee who visited me on the set of Boys Will Be Boys in Los Angeles. She came out with her parents. Uh just got offered the role of a, of a young antagonist in the TV show. And um, uh, she had a condition where she was confined to a wheelchair 
she couldn't really speak. Her mother translated what she said or what she wrote. She would rewrite. Jennifer was just incredibly there for me from that point on into this very day. Um, I see her in this very special, um, very special. Uh, and then I had another child named Kelly Lopez from Albuquerque, New Mexico, who, uh, who met me at Ed DeBevick's in Los Angeles, a diner from the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And uh, Kelly has kept in touch for 20 years now. Uh, hold on, here comes Marnie, Jarrell, hold on. Marnie, his family's in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, Kelly's, like I said, in love with James Franco and David Lipper and Chad Allen. Remember Chad Allen from Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, he's a big fan of hers too. Um, yeah, Kelly, she's all about the heart and that's pretty much it. She's, you know, love, she's right. real love too. It doesn't matter how you look, mm. it's how your heart feels and beats, you know, it's like you got a beating heart in your chest. It's going like this. I think it's her, it's Kelly. She's in my chest. I can't hurt her. I don't want to. You know, right. she gave me her heart. She gave me her heart, Drew. Mm -hmm. Kelly. Yeah. So, can you tell us about any projects that you're currently working on? We mentioned the songs at the top of the interview with Sam. Are you working on anything else besides those songs? Yes. Yes, I am. I'm working on a song right now about. Uh, uh, a girl named Mari out here who has, uh, uh, she has, she has, an, she's about brand new, making brand new the stars. She's about, Kelly is, or I mean, uh, uh, Mari's about brand, making stars brand new. Also, not injure, not injuring you. When she does it, when she does things, she doesn't injure you. She's not. She, her meaning is not to hurt. So I said, "What a beautiful thing to write about." Let me write about that. This, this woman, Mari, who doesn't injure me. She just doesn't. So uh, that's what the song's about. It's called "Her Stuff." It's about her. Okay. Yeah, we definitely look forward to it when it comes out. And do you have any shout outs you want to give before we conclude this interview, Jeremy? Yeah, shout out to uh, Marnie, Marnie Cohen, Jordan Muller, uh, Michael Ryan, Zodi. That's it. That's it. Uh, and I appreciate you wholeheartedly for doing this interview with me because I know you rarely give interviews. So I definitely appreciate you wholeheartedly. And like I stated earlier, people, you can catch the songs that he and Sam Ross have worked on only on the audio version of the podcast, which is available on Anchor, Spotify, Breaker, TuneIn, Stitcher Radio, wherever you get your podcasts. And the video version of this interview will be available on my YouTube channel of the same name. Ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. The one, the only, the talented Mr. Jeremy Jordan. Jeremy, thank you so very much for doing this interview. You're welcome.